Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep his commandments, the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water and of fountains of depths that spring out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of, of, of oil, olive and honey, a land where thou eatest, thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of those hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and are full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he giveth thee. Beware that thou forget not uh, his commandments, in not keeping his commandments, and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full, and hast built goodly houses, and dwell therein, and when thy herds and thy flock multiply, and silver and gold is multiplied, and all thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up. Thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of uh, bondage. Heavenly Father, bless your word. Uh, we just pray, God, for for all of our missionaries and, and Janelle, Lord, as she uh, gets our, her support, I pray, God, you'd raise up people that will uh, give to help. Uh, Lord, get her on the field and bless her there. Give her uh, many years of service and blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. God's law is... Uh, it's a mirror. We read about that mirror in uh, James. It calls it the perfect law of liberty. And what it's talking about, it shows us. And I think sometimes we, we uh, over time we learn what we're, what we're really in for as Christians. You know, we look sometimes at this thing as a young Christian. You look, if I can look at it like this, if I can get through this rough time, it's going to be smooth sailing from uh, here on out. That's, that's not always how it goes. So God's law that was given, and, and this is remembering God, remembering the law of God. The mirror of the law shows us our sin. We need to see that. We need to look at ourselves, not others. We certainly don't judge others as the same way we judge ourselves. We're a lot more merciful <laughs> uh, with our own sins than we are other people. Uh, the law also is a boundary that um, holds our sinful nature in check. We, we're looking for blessings a lot of times, which is good, and God has blessings, but we have to get ourselves in line with God. God describes it like, like a child. There's a chastening. Uh, that is a training, you know, and I, I look at, uh, I look at uh, my grandkids, I look at other people's kids, and I, I, I see the constant correction, constant teaching that goes on, and we did that too, and I'm like, wow, that's exhausting, but it's exhausting for God if he could be exhausted, but God's always trying to to correct us and get us in, in the right thing, uh, right uh, frame of mind and right service. The thing we need to understand is the greatest enemy we have is not the devil. The great, he is an enemy. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You want to know who your worst enemy is? Look in the mirror. That's who it is. And, and we... Uh, we see the character of God, but we don't re really see the character of humanity. And God has to, our stubbornness, our pridefulness, our forgetfulness, our unthankfulness as people, uh, God has to correct that all the time. And we wonder, and sometimes God will put us through things and we're like, what's going on here? 
and we'll talk to other people. We'll talk to the preacher. We'll look in the Bible. What's going on here? And over time, God said, okay, you figure it out. What do you think the problem is? And then we, we figure out we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing or not doing it the right way. So the law is our mirror that shows us our sin. It's a boundary that holds our sinful nature in check, and it shows us our need for Jesus. One of the things, one of the points we see on this last point here is our, our service for God, we have to have his power. And, and it's so different than any principle in the world before we come to Christ is, is this thing of our weakness. We get power through weakness. That is, that person, that selfish person in the mirror, we got to kind of get out of the way and acknowledge because in our, in our prideful nature, we say, oh, I can do this. I absolutely can do this. And God says, no, you can't. You can't. And we find out through various tests in life right quickly that we can't. And uh, well, what do we do? Well, we let God work through us. So it's the opposite of how the world uh, works. So why did God? Uh, why did God bring them through this wilderness wandering? <clears throat> why did God bring them out of Egypt? Uh, God led them these forty years. It says in verse two in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee. We need to constantly be in check on our humility. And uh, it's, a, it's a sneaky thing. It's a de deceitful thing to, uh, when, when pride gets in the way, and that's why we need church. That's why we need a lot of church. That's why we need devotions. We need the Bible. We need prayer because it's a, it's a more peaceful way to walk in humility than it is in pride. There's a strife going on in pride uh, with, the, with the Holy Spirit and the sin nature. So he wanted to humble them that they would trust him. And they went without water. What are you doing, God? We're, we're, we're doing without water here. I thought you were going to take care of us. God is doing that because he wants to get them to understand lest they think they did it, they made the changes, they uh, are in control of their life. We need to walk in humility. It's one of the most important things that we need in the Christian life. I can't, God can. I'm not better than other people. We're all in this together, and we all need God. We all need to realize we can't do it. Because when you get, when you lose your humility, get judgmental. Why can't they be as good as I am? You know, why can't my brother in Christ be like me? Well, he wanted to humble them. He, they went without water. They went without food. And hey, listen, if God didn't take care of them, they're going to die of thirst. You're talking about getting our attention. Sometimes God allows us to struggle to get our attention. And uh, they're, they're, they could starve to death. They could thirst to death. They're vulnerable to attack. There's two mindsets, two basic mindsets we can have as Christians. And we have this nature that wants us to get out of the fight, to, to go back to uh, uh, a worry-free life, which worry-free is good, but we look at it the wrong way. I want to go through life and I don't want to have to fight battles. I don't want to have to uh, deal with these issues. I don't want to have to humble myself. But yet we, we have to. They're vulnerable to attack. And we need God. We need to have that nature that says, I totally trust God. And you know, it's another thing too. I've tried to find a way to say this. We need to, we need to trust God in us. You know, we say a lot of times we can't, we can't do something, and yet we can do it, and God will enable us to do it, and then we'll just 
take another step up, we'll grow a little bit. So the mindset that, that we have sometimes is, um, you know, yeah, God's with me, yeah, God's helping me, but I can't serve him. It's too much, it's too big. You need to trust God in you. Greater is he that is within you than he that's in the world. That affects witnessing. Satan says, you can't do this. It's a big, it's, it's a grand thing. It's, it's an amazing thing. You gotta know what you're doing. You can't be a witness. You're, you're a witness whether you witness or not. You're a poor witness or you're a good witness. <laughs> You're a good Christian or you're not a good Christian, but you're a Christian. You're a soldier. And, uh, and as a soldier, you got to understand you're fighting a battle. And, and that's a good mindset. You can do this. You can do this. So uh, th they're fighting this thing. They get uh, attacked as they cross the desert. And without God, they're going to be destroyed. You've got to trust God. He will put you in a position where you have to trust him. you got to trust him. I went through absolute terror. My wife will tell you, when God called me to preach, I don't know why I continued. It was torment. And when I had to speak to people, now I love it, but when I had to speak to people, I was so self-conscious and so afraid but then uh, for, for a, uh, probably a couple of years, every time I preached was just torment. It took me a week to get over it. And, uh, but now I'm, I'm focused on the message. I believe that God can use me. I believe that God has used me. And it's not me, it's God in me. And it's the Holy Spirit in you and God can use you and God is using you and God will use you. So he, he got them there. He took them through that to humble them. They're not able. You're not able. And, uh, you know, you can rest when you got somebody else fighting your battles. You can rest when it doesn't depend on you. It's God. And he can even use your failings. I, I hear a lot of successful people in, in sports and in, uh, uh, in, in, other, in the public eye that say failure is one of the greatest teachers. When you fail in an area, it's just God revealing to you, hey, you need to, you need to kind of change some things a little bit. So God took them through the wilderness to prove them. That word means to test them. I get so aggravated after being saved all these years. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I get aggravated when I feel like I'm going through another test. You ever took a test in school that you thought we just had one last week and now we're doing the end of a chapter test. Why, why test? You know, you, it's frustrating. But there's so much more going on than, than what we can see with, with a narrow focus. It's a multitude of things going on. And if you're going to grow in faith, which is going to give you the ability to do exploits, to do great things you didn't think you could do, you're going to have to go through certain tests to prove you, not to prove to God what's inside of you. God already knows, but to show you. And there's nothing like a test to, <laughs> to show you what you know. And God does that to bring out what's inside of us and we're like, oh, wow, I, I didn't know that about me. But God knew, and so God wanted them to know their own hearts. Uh, do they have enough humility? Do they trust him enough? Do they understand uh, that God is making of them, uh, God's making of them a, uh, a people, and they got to have character. And God does that in the church, and he lets us go through things when you stop growing, when a church stops growing in Christ, boy, that's when you have the trouble. That's, you, get, you get the flesh coming out. Where there's no preaching, where there's no teaching, where there's no light, we just we, we implode. And, and 
the mess, as bad as we can get sometimes, the mess is not near as bad as it could be. You get one or two people get out of sorts with the Lord, then they get it right. You get a church full of people out of sorts with the, with the Lord, and we've not had that, I don't think. I, you got some serious problems. You forget about witnessing. You forget about the fruits of the Spirit. You forget about putting one another first. I talk to people sometimes in Christian work, and I get the idea that they leave God completely out of the equation. You see that in our service, not our this service, but our service out there in the world, that, oh, I believe God, I love God, and we're not willing to put anything much into our service. We should be equal with every endeavor in life, with our jobs, with our family, with what, what diligence we have in this world should come out in our service for God. It's hard to get people to do stuff anymore. It really is in all churches. Can you make it convenient for me? No. Can you make it where it doesn't require sacrifice? No. You know why we all do that? Because we don't believe God. We don't believe we're doing it for God, or we don't believe we can do it for God. Give me an amen here. Come on, work with me. God showed them their own, uh, their own heart in Exodus uh, 17. I want to talk about uh, Moses for a minute. I'm talk about God's power. God, God tests us. God allows us, shows us our, do we have humility? Do we have, and by the way, let me say this. When, when, you, when you're wrong in something and you make it right, now I believe we confess our faults one to another. We don't confess our sins one to another. Every now and then somebody says, preacher, you need to confess your sin. Good, we'll do you next. <laughs> I'll get mine out of the way. We'll do what I've observed yeah. Amen. as a professional pastor. Let me, let me do yours next. We confess our faults one to another. I'd be careful who I confess my sins to. I'd keep that to Jesus and somebody you really, really trust. I've got, I tell another preacher in town, I've got a, uh, the other day, I've got accountability partners. Where I, I, I got about three people that I call when, when I, I think there might be a problem. Before a problem ever starts, I said, hey, this might be a problem. And it kind of served me well. You let people know some things. You confess your faults one to another. But listen, we're weak creatures. And if you're truly humble, you're repenting all the time. Don't you hate it? When you repent, you've got to admit you're not there yet. I'm just not there yet. But you go to God and say, God, you know what? You pointed out something. I've got a wrong attitude. Yeah, it would do us all good to uh, look in the Bible of that and sin in particular. There are certain sins that God says, I hate. I would have put different sins there. I've there are some sins I think are worse than what God thinks they are. That's a little humor there to make a point. And God mentioned some sins. I hate this. He used the word hate. You're not supposed to hate people, Jesus. There's righteous indignation. God said, I hate this sin. But we treat certain sins, go read it. We treat certain sins like, how bad can they be? Bad enough that God hates them. Amen. And the ones we think should be in that list of six things are not in it, are they? But God says, I hate this. Lastly, God proves us. God tests us. God humbles us to show his power in weakness. Now, here's an interesting story of, of Moses, and, and, and he go, they're going out to battle, and uh, 
God had instructed that when Moses held his hands up, they'd be winning. I mean, you, you ever held your hand? I was trying to help with this, and what was I doing? Uh, doing something with the wires. They weren't on, I found out, but uh, power wasn't on. But I held my hands up by about a minute, and anybody ever do it? You just, you're exhausted. You can't do it for so long. And God said, I'm going to teach you something by this. And they finally got a rock for Moses to sit on. And, we, and the Bible says in verse 11 in Exodus 17, uh, they're, they're battling the uh, Amalekites, I believe it was. Uh, and, uh, and it came to pass when Moses held up his hands that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat there on, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady under the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomforted, discomforted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. The Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. Here's your memorial day. Right there, remember this. What does that teach us? It teaches that we're all in this together. It teaches us that we need to help one another. Pastor needs help. Hello, I need help. Amen. We hold up our hands. I told my wife two days in a row, I said, are you praying about people coming to celebrate recovery? I told her right before, didn't I, baby? And she had how many? Three? I had three, three visitors come in. And sometimes, and I find it with myself, sometimes I forget to pray for that. Prayer is everything. It's like, I can't think of a good illustration. You get kind of halfway through something, you, you've got you to gotta finish it. Witnessing is great. Prayer finishes it. Are you praying? Because if we get people to come to CR, it encourages people that are doing it, and it's helping people. Helping people. Pray for that. Pray for the upper county service. Pray for this church service. Casey, well, I, I put that on the uh, prayer line a while back, and Casey said, everybody I invited was, everybody I prayed about was here. That's pretty good. She's a prayer warrior. You want your prayers answered, go to her. That's a, that's a proof right there. Pray about this stuff like it matters. Hope we have a pleasant service today. Hope it's entertaining. Hope we learn something. I don't. I hope we change. I hope we reach the lost. I hope we grow in Christ. There's nothing more exciting than to watch people come in the church and just go for God. Start witnessing like it means something. To go for God. Son Chales in Alaska now, her grandfather passed away, and uh, Harold was saying she's witness to everybody she sees. That's a growing thing. And, and you know, you grow and you do that, and I've been through that. We've all been through that. If you've been saved any length of time and grown, and you, you, you get that opportunity, and she's shining for Jesus right now. Harold, not so much, but <laughs> Sanchel is shining for Jesus, and she's witnessing. She's a great witness. He is too. And, and they witness, and she's witnessing to all of her family. That's great. That's what it is. That's how you grow. And you got to be humble when you do that. And you got to trust God when you do that. And you got to feel your own weakness. You feel your weakness. I feel weakness all the time. I get up sometimes and, and get ready to preach. And I feel I've got like five or six sermons I could preach at any time. And usually I'll try to combine two together and try to find out what it is that God wants me to, to say and the direction within the parameters of that scripture that I need to go. There's a lot of ways to go. And I sometimes I pray, God, I cannot do it. It's so important. 
and I just can't do it. And, and God, I'm amazed at how God helps me. And when God helps me, I always say, I knew I could do it. I'm pretty good, God. <laughs> I'm pretty good, Lord. No, I'm not. I love joking about that. There's just, it's just hilarious to me to do the opposite of what God says in our attitude. And I, I'm feeling humility in my heart, but you'll never know it. He shows his power and weakness. I can't do it. I learned that in the early days preaching. I learned I, I, I can't do this. And then God did it. Witnessing, I, I, I still feel that. I, I talk to people. God brings people to me. And I think, this is so important. What scripture do I use? What is it I need to say? And I used to push it and force it and witness to somebody whether they liked it or not, and God started leading me. The other day, I'm sitting at the farmer's market. Was that last week? I, I think I told some of y'all about that. I'm sitting at the farmer's market, and uh, I'm sitting out at the coffee shop, and I thought, I need to witness to somebody. And the devil said, well, good, grab somebody. I said, nope, I'm wait on God. And I went and got something from the hardware store, and I walked back. As a group there, they're pretty good. They're pretty good singers. They're from a, another church, I think, but they were singing secular songs. They're good songs. I mean, it sounded really good. And I'm coming back, and they're singing, "I'll Fly Away." And I thought, "Hello, that's it." There's my open door. And I just walked up. I said, "Can I sing with y'all?" They said, "Yeah." Here's the words. I said, "Oh, I know the words. <laughs> I know the words." I know the event. I know the Savior. And I just sang it with them. I couldn't wait. It was like it had 40 verses in it, it felt like. I thought they'd never get to the end. Since they got to the end, I said, hey, do you guys know the reality? There's about four of them. You know the reality of this? Undoubtedly not. I said, do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? Undoubtedly not. No reaction, but that time, God's timing. Kathy and Sanchel and Harold came up, had gospel tracks. I was going to go get them a track, and they horned in on my witnessing, <laughs> gave them a track. And so I'm thinking, that was a God thing. God was with me. Let's close in prayer. I do want to say this, too. We need to get back at the farmer's market. We used to do a ministry there. Sat in a chair. Bonnie just shook her head. I'm assuming she means, yeah, I'm going to help, or does she mean, yeah, they need to get back. Was it they or we? They, they need to get, they, she says, need to get back. So we put a little sign up there, and we hand out tracts. Art's done it. I've done it. Patrick did it. Took the kids up there. Bless his heart. When he had cancer, he did it. He got treasures in heaven. I can't get Reed to do it to save my life. <laughs> It'd be great. We had some young, good-looking men up there instead of me. Amen. <laughs> It'd be great. Dan, you could do it. I'll let you do it if you want. But that'd be great. Set up for an hour, get a couple people, have a cup of coffee. Smoke a cigarette and relax and tell people about Jesus.